Ladies and gentlemen, here's a man who walked his butts off and traveled around the world to bring you exciting stories of fascinating destinations and amazing helpful ideas to make your lives easier. He's a man of many moves and definitely many recipes. Here's our wacky walker, Stephen Yan. Wow, that's good. Walks up because I've got the new thing that I have quit. Quit smoking so that we can cut all the pollution. See, and that's right. Well, personally, I quit smoking. And I mean quit. And no yeefs, no ends, and no buts. <laughs> and you know, people who give up smoking have the same problem as people spending their first day at a nudist camp. What to do with their hands? <laughs> That's right. Now, personally, I have a very fundamental attitude towards cigarettes. You know, if God wanted us to smoke, he would have given us chimneys on the head. <laughs> and there's a big uh, crash program going on now, you know, to uh, make a, a synthetic tobacco from vegetables. Can't you see yourself going into a store and say, give me a pack of asparagus, plain tips. <laughs> say you're ready for your trip and you have made plans and you have packed your clothes and you can't wait to hit the beach. While you're away from home, accidents and injury can happen. Too much suntan can cause severe burn to your skin. And then sometime when you're flying on the aircraft, you know, you might have a motion sickness or ear ache, you know, all those things. Or sometimes even the stings from the jellyfish can be painful. Now, you might end up coming home in wheelchairs or even on stretchers. Have no fear, my friend. Our medical expert will offer helpful advice to handle such unpleasant experiences. We'll meet two famous ladies from the province of British Columbia in Canada they will give us a guided tour to visit the beautiful garden city of Vancouver. They both claim the place is beautiful and we'll give them a chance to prove it. And we'll meet a woman who would uh, scare the daylight out of Donald Duck. So all this is lined up for you. Okay, now let's get started. You know, wherever I go, I always say, okay, that place is beautiful. And the people say, wow, it's beautiful. But in British Columbia, not only they say it's beautiful in words, but also they put that on their license plate, you know, the beautiful BC. Now, that city is uh, green all year round and is famous for its gardens around the city. I travel a lot, but whenever I see a nice place, People always say, this place is beautiful. But in this province, not only the people saying it, even the license plate, they say, beautiful British Columbia. Well, you want to know why? Let's meet the lady of the province, the wife of the premier, Mrs. Lillian Wendersham. Normally, when you visit the first lady of a province, you expect to see a mansion like the White House. But Lillian has chosen this place called Fantasy Gardens as her residence. It is surrounded by replicas of European architectural structures. Inside, you will find buildings such as a Belgium waffle bakery, candy stores and restaurants that are normally found in Europe. Some of them are stores selling imported souvenirs from all parts of the continent. It surely is an unusual place to find the wife of the Premier of British Columbia. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank boy, you. that's good. How are Thanks, you this wonderful. Morning? Yeah, this beautiful. Yeah, why do you call yourself beautiful BC here? It's the most beautiful province in the world, you bet. We have the most. Beautiful gardens in British Columbia. I think more gardens than anywhere in the world. The mild climate all year round will guarantee that the flowers will bloom as early as January. Come with me to the garden and I'll show you.
This garden was originally built on 21 acres of farmland in Richmond, 20 minutes from downtown Vancouver. It was opened in 1984 and has become one of the popular attractions for tourists and local residents. The winding pathway takes visitors for a leisurely stroll past massive flower beds, perfectly manicured lush green lawns and shrubs. Your eyes will be charmed with the array of flowers. It is such a picturesque setting. This garden makes a dramatic backdrop, perfect for many local weddings. This castle is a replica of the Kowarden Castle in Holland. And there's something more sentimental. This bell tower was imported and dedicated to the Canadian soldiers who liberated the premier's hometown in Holland during the war. This garden was built to fulfill Mr. Van der Sen's fantasy to promote his ethnic heritage and incorporate his hobby, gardening. His botanical appreciation extended across the ocean and this exotic Japanese-Chinese garden was added to promote a contrast of color and tranquility. This is uh, the largest floral Bible in the world and uh, it's to teach the children it's I am the way and then the statues show the birth of uh, Jesus and the story uh, right up to resurrection. Not far from Fantasy Garden is a unique Chinese garden right in the middle of Vancouver's Chinatown. It is Dr. Sheng Yixian Garden, the first classical garden ever built outside China. From the authentic Chinese pagoda, ponds and waterfalls to the intricate artistry of the terraces, the detail is exquisite. There's a lot of rock, but this is no place for a rock concert. No, I don't think so. You put your hand there. Okay. Huh? This is the rock just for you. Why? Because you won't get carried away. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Well, we won't get carried away. Lillian and I are taking a short break. And after this commercial, we'll come back to show you how many barbecue ducks have been murdered under the cleaver of a woman in Chinatown. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, Lillian and I are going to take you to Vancouver Vancouver has the second largest Chinatown outside China. Because of the mild climate in Vancouver, it is ideal for growing Chinese vegetables. There are plenty of them, some even better than those found in China. Chinatown is just like another Hong Kong. The aroma of barbecue pork and ducks is an attraction to everyone. This lady has been working here for over 20 years. Every day, she chops continuously. And over the years, millions of ducks have met their fate under her cleaver. Historic Guest Town was the site of the first village of Vancouver, which was burned to the ground a century ago. It has been rebuilt and is now a popular tourist attraction filled with restaurants and boutiques. It is also a place for the local artists to display their talents. Isn't that fantastic? This is the Gastown steam clock, the world's first steam powered clock, and we're very lucky to have it in British Columbia. Oh, is there a lot of hot air there? There's a lot of hot air there, that's for sure, but it rings every 15 minutes. It's beautiful. Under this distinctive dome of the Bloedel Foro Conservatory, it's a perfect place to visit, no matter what the weather is. Now, this is quite a sight, isn't it? It feels like in the tropics. 
You don't have to leave British Columbia to uh, see uh, or visit the tropics. We have it all here under the dome. Under the dome here. In British Columbia. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous, isn't it? And the, yeah. the birds, the tropical birds, and the koi fish. Uh, it's beautiful. Trees and plants can be found from lush tropical environments to desert areas. This is certainly a colorful place to catch your fancy, where seasonal blossoms show their best colors throughout the year. Just like in a huge greenhouse, you find exotic plants from every biotic region of the world. They are all here, under one roof for everybody to enjoy. See under the dome, Stephen, what we have, all this tropical beauty. Uh, you don't have to go to the tropics at all to uh, see palm trees and staghorn ferns and banana trees and see the oh, palms right there. there. Isn't you, that something? Yeah. They're a little green right now, but they'll turn yellow. That is uh, Beethoven's favorite fruit. How you, do know you know what that? it is? What? Banana, banana. <laughs> <laughs> Situated at the highest point of the city, Queen Elizabeth Park, known as the Little Mountain, commands the panoramic view of the city of Vancouver. It's a great place for taking pictures. Once a quarry, this park is now beautifully landscaped with waterfalls, flowers, and has an ideal setting for outdoor wedding. British Columbia certainly deserves to be called beautiful. No wonder Leland says. Fantastic! Fantastic! Coming up, we are going to meet Miss Vancouver, who's going to take us to the Rose Garden for lunch. I'll be right back. Well, Vancouver is a beautiful city, and one of the uh, you know, best attractions is called the Stanley Park. And the people, when they go there, boy, they would not have any argument with Miss Vancouver, Julie Smith. You bet, we have every right to call ourselves beautiful. Vancouver is often referred to as a four season vacation land, with spring starting as early as March. Vancouver's mild climate guarantees green lawns and flowering gardens year round. And to prove my point, let me take you through the world famous Stanley Park. Well, I never promised you a rose garden, but here we are. And the roses are everywhere, and aren't they beautiful? Everything you heard about Stanley Park is true. Gorgeous flowers are blooming everywhere as early as in March. In fact, these roses look so good, we had to have a taste. Not bad. It only needs some soy sauce. Not all flowers are edible. They are here for your eyes only but definitely it's not for your stomach. Stanley Park is beautiful, but there's no point in coming to Stanley Park unless you come to Prospect Point. You don't come here to get your prospects, but you do come here to get a great view of Vancouver. This is the Lionsgate Bridge. It's one of the few suspension bridges in Canada, and it's architecturally structured similar to the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. At the end of the bridge and looking up, we can see Grouse Mountain, which is one of the city's most famous ski resorts where they're skiing night and day. Stanley Park is circled by a sea wall, where walkers, cyclists and joggers can go around the park all year round. This sea wall is about five miles long and you can see the spectacular changing view of the waterfront. called a girl in a wetsuit, and it's the answer to the Little Mermaid in Copenhagen, Denmark. The seagull's not supposed to be there. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> this park has something for everyone. This is an ideal place for the family to enjoy, where the children can get wet in the water and the adults can get some suntan in the warm weather.
wonder what this sign mean? It means sitting alone is not allowed. Wow, there's something very strange over there. This is a hollow tree. As you can see, it's actually hollow inside, almost as big as an apartment. Let's move in. This is a place my mom and dad used to hang out. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a nine o'clock gun, and it's been here since 1894. When the fishermen used to fish out here, the nine o'clock gun would go off, telling them that it was time to bring in their nets and come home and grab a Big Mac. Nowadays, it still goes off. I guess it was an old-fashioned sort of alarm clock or something. One of the fun way to see Stanley Park is by bicycle. There's a path specially designed for cyclists to ride around the seawall. Riding a bicycle for two like this surely can bring up your romantic mood. This collection of totem pole were carved and contributed by the Indians of the province of British Columbia. These unique and colorful pieces of art depict the legends of the Indian heritage. Some of these have been on display at Expo 86 in the city. This visitor came all the way from Japan to skate around the park. She thought Stanley Park is number one. As she described in her language, Stanley Park is Ichiban. <laughs> the key to a successful vacation is a carefree vacation. And today we're very lucky. We have my good friend who is the director of the emergency services at the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster in Vancouver. And uh, his name is Dr. Les Mutasi. Please join me in welcoming him and learn something. <laughs> hey, how are you? Fine, fine. Well, nice to have you in our show because a lot of people, they travel, they always uh, worry about getting into trouble. And uh, one of the common troubles that they have is uh, motion sickness. That's right. It's a sure way to ruin a travel plan, isn't it? Yeah. To be sick on an airplane That's or right. on a boat and be stuck there. That's right. There are a few tricks, though, that people can do to, you know, to prevent the motion sickness. And everyone thinks, you know, uh, uh, first of using drugs such as gravol or antihistamine drugs like that, but they can make you quite drowsy and they don't always help motion sickness. So there are some other things that you can do as well. There is a relatively new drug available in this country that you, you know, you put behind your ear which is a scopolamine compound, and it's quite effective at preventing, but it's uh, mostly good for long trips, such as if you're going on a cruise. You see, you have to put it on your ear, you have to put it behind your ear. Behind a ear. At least 12 hours, you oh. see, before you go. So you can't just sort of quickly put it in there. It doesn't work that fast. Is something like the pressure puncture no, principle? No. <laughs> or something no, that's like pulling that, no. your, your ear? No, actually it's absorbed directly through the skin, and it's I a slow release sort of thing. And uh, the, it's not to, for everyone, unfortunately. There are some people who can't take it. It does have some side effects, such as drying your mouth and so on. And children, especially, are very sensitive to it. It can cause hallucinations. So it's a good idea to try it out first before you are going to use it. And if it's not good for you, uh, then you shouldn't be using it. And what do people do when they are traveling in the car, you know, uh, inside of the airplane? Right. For the motion sickness, uh, I was told that people should look straight. And then don't look sideways because those movements might affect your That's mind right. or something. Is it true? Sense of movement uh, can be fooled and make you feel uh, like you're dizzy. And one of the bad things to do, of course, is reading while you're driving. Not especially while you're driving, but especially if you're a passenger in the I car, so. for example. Yeah. If you're driving, you should definitely not be reading. Right. Um, not reading and not drinking. No, and not drinking. That's, That's right. right. That's, That's important. Right. But on the airplane, one little other little trick you can do that does not involve the use of drugs is to make sure you don't drink very much. I don't mean, uh, by that, I don't mean alcohol. I mean, don't drink very much fluid or, or liquid or especially juices which are acidic to your stomach. Oh. And mainly keep your stomach dry before you get on a plane and just have a little bread or something you know, like that that will soak up the acid in your stomach. And that uh, uh, also will soak up the acid that you make when you're in the air and it will help prevent That would help. Yeah. Now, what about uh, people who have a ear ache, you know, problem? Oh, yeah. And uh, I was told that uh, even some people who have a, a hole in their teeth, you know, the cavity, when they go up uh, traveling by air, because the change of the atmosphere, the air pocket inside the cavity will expand and you will cause a toothache and headache too. Well, Is yes, it true? yes, you can cause quite severe toothache. 
Um, mostly people get trouble with their ears when they're, when they're traveling and of course when you go up to altitude, it's 8,000 feet up there, there's less air there than down here so the air that's trapped tends to expand. Usually the expansion in your ear is not a problem because the extra air comes out but when you're coming down it has a little more trouble getting in and that can cause quite severe earache. You're talking about air. Uh, you mentioned a little while ago about a hypoxia. Is it the right name? Hypoxia, yes, hypoxia. hypoxia. What is that? Hypoxia means less oxygen than you should have. Of course, again, at 8,000 feet, there's less air. That means there's less oxygen. Now, a little less oxygen doesn't matter if you're healthy so much uh, for you and I. For example, we can tolerate it quite well. In fact, uh, we don't notice anything. Now, uh, people do get a little giddy up there. Just You don't notice it, but it's just enough to make you feel a little good, you know. And, uh, of course, the alcohol, if you're having a drink up there, helps as well. But um, usually it's not a real health hazard unless you have underlying chronic lung disease, chronic asthma, no, asthma emphysema. And emphysema. Yes, emphysema. They have a very small uh, capacity to. That's to right. Get they the really oxygen. can't tolerate any less oxygen than they have uh, at sea level. And they will get into severe trouble up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, just last year, I happened to be on a flight, a transatlantic flight, in fact, and a lady just across the way from me mm -hmm. developed some shortness of breath and went into a little bit of heart failure precipitated by being up there at that altitude, and she needed oxygen. Now, if she had known that ahead of time, she could have prepared the stewardess for the fact that she might need supplementary oxygen. Mm -hmm. I think and that's available, you know, for you mm -hmm. if you ask for it or if you have a doctor's letter. Yeah. Well, another thing is in traveling, quite often, with, particularly when you're camping or walking in, let's say, Australia. Australia, you know, where there's a lot of poisonous snakes. Now, for the snake bite, a lot of people have all kinds of misconceptions. Some people say that after the snake has bitten you, you should uh, bite on your, the area, you know, suck the blood out. Uh, now, what, what do you say about that? <laughs> well, um, it's it in fact, uh, it, it, it is supposed to help to suck the area out, but I don't think it helps that much. I think the main thing is that if you have a poisonous snake bite, you're going to get a lot of pain at the site, a lot of swelling at the site. You want to minimize the amount that that, uh, the distance of that poison travels because in your arm, it can do some damage to your arm, but if it travels all the way up to your heart or your, the rest of your body, it's going to do even more damage. So the more active you are, the worse it is. Now, uh, so you should calm down and then not running around and chase the, the snake. Right, that's right. And the other thing to remember, that's right. The other thing to remember is that most poisons you know, if you're in an area such as Australia, they know the snakes they have, they know the poisons, and, and most of the hospitals will carry an antidote for that specific poison. So you should get to a hospital, let them worry about it, let them figure out what it is, and they and most times will have an antidote. They can give you and neutralize the poison. Mm -hmm. Well, that's important because at one time I was told, oh, there are two different kinds of snake, poisonous and non-poisonous. You have to look at the teeth mark. Boy, I think it's a waste of time. You try to figure it out whether poisonous or, or non-poisonous, you'll be uh, all lying down on the, on the table. And uh, it won't work that way, right? Another thing I like to let the folks know is this. If you have problem in hearing while you're traveling, you should notify the airline so that when they give all the instruction, they can write it down to you and give you sign language. Otherwise, you know, they assume everybody can hear. And that can be a problem, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, uh, Les. Uh, really appreciate it. You know, really, uh, there's all the information you gave us, the folks at home can use because they are just everyday incidents, you know, in travel. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this show. And we hope that you will tune in again and travel with us without leaving your living room. And I enjoyed this. I hope you did too. And this is Stephen Yen. Next time when we meet, say, walks up. <laughs> <laughs>